Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. There's a new storm warning for a number of residents in BC as many regions prepare for an onslaught of more rain. Federal Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole addressed his caucus and said Canadians should be concerned with a potential Liberal NDP merger. And a 39-year-old man in Wisconsin who drove his SUV into a Christmas parade could face up to six consecutive life sentences. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. After two and a half years at the helm, Lethbridge Fire Chief Mark Rathwell is retiring. His final day will be February 11th of next year. As we hear from Micah Quinn, the city is hoping to have a new fire chief in place by mid-January. Mark Rathwell was hired in 1996 as a paramedic and firefighter, and years later, he became the medical training officer in 2010. In 2014, he served as a lieutenant and went on to become captain in 2016. He continued his success with the deputy chief spot in 2018 and then became the city's full-time fire chief in 2019. He says the key to his success during his time with the city was the staff that he worked with. I wouldn't have gotten to this point without all the mentoring and coaching that I received from all the senior folks uh, when I first got on the job and right up to including all the folks that uh, help me daily uh, to get through all the pieces that we have to. It's a team approach, it always has been, and uh, without those support pieces in place, you, you can't get this job done. Rathwell was a vocal proponent for the retention of Lethbridge's integrated service delivery model and dealt with the ongoing drug crisis in our city. He started his job as chief just before the pandemic started. The mayor of Lethbridge, Blaine Higgin, says while on council, Rathwell was someone he could always ask questions of and trust to know that he will receive good answers as to what EMS is doing in the city. And that really came to light uh, when it came to the EMS dispatch and, and, and how, how hard our chief advocated on, on behalf of the citizens of Lethbridge to keep that service so that it was, uh, um, you know, again, for, for the safety of our, of our community. The Chief of Community Services for the City of Lethbridge, Mike Fox, says the new fire chief will be selected through an internal process. We're looking for a, a, a leader that can look to the future and prepare the department for the future challenges that are coming but also look at the current issues and be up to date on the current issues enough to step in and, and, and tackle those issues with the same command that uh, Chief Rathwell has. You might be wondering what's next for Rathwell now that he's announced he'll be retiring. He says it's time to relax and spend some time as a new grandfather. After that, he'll be looking at future opportunities down the road in a few months. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. The Lethbridge Police Commission says it will not be holding a public inquiry into allegations against the Lethbridge Police Service after it was asked to do so by the attorney who represents MLA Shannon Phillips and a woman who made sexual misconduct allegations against a former LPS inspector. Jeanette Rocher has the details. On September 27th, Calgary attorney Michael Bates of Rutan Bates Law Firm requested that the Lethbridge Police Commission conduct the inquiry pursuant to Section 32 of the Police Act. After receiving letters intended for his clients, MLA Shannon Phillips and the woman who earlier this year accused former Lethbridge Police Inspector Bill Kay of sexual misconduct. Remember her? We referred to that woman as Emma and kept her identity hidden in an exclusive interview she did with Bridge City News. I feel I was absolutely manipulated. We're talking about someone who policed longer than I've been alive. That case is still under investigation by the General Investigative Section in Airdrie. At the time, though, Emma said she wasn't treated fairly by the authorities she reported it to at Lethbridge Police Service. It's about justice. It's about protecting the vulnerable. Since that time, an anonymous letter was sent to her attorney, Michael Bates. She tells Bridge City News, quote, When I first read my letter, I was horrified and sad. The content of my letter is insulting and disturbing. I fear for victims in our community because of what it says. Every time I read it, I feel nauseated. Emma would not go into detail about the letter's exact contents. Bates also received a letter or letters intended for his other client, Lethbridge MLA Shannon Phillips, who had opened a case with him to have LPS investigated for a number of allegations, including unauthorized database searches on her and having pictures unknowingly taken and posted of her at a Lethbridge diner. Officers involved in those cases have been disciplined by LPS, but Phillips was not satisfied with the sanctions and made an appeal for a public hearing into the matter, an appeal which was denied by Police Chief Shaheen Medizadeh. 
Now it's the police commission, which is denying a request for a public inquiry. It's believed by those involved that the anonymous letters sent to Rattan Bates Law Office allegedly came from somewhere inside LPS. A press release sent by Police Commission Rob Van Spronson explains his decision, saying, quote, The LPC determined that the circumstances around the request are problematic and make a proper investigation particularly difficult. After careful consideration of the request, the Lethbridge Police Commission decided not to order a Section 32 public inquiry. End quote. For her part, Emma told Bridge City News, at this time she won't be commenting on the police commission's decision. For Bridge City News, I'm Jeanette Roche. The pandemic and recent devastation of British Columbia has created a lot of anxiety for a number of Canadians. Now that's according to Dr. Trevor Harrison, professor of sociology at the University of Lethbridge. Dr. Harrison says we're seeing a number of changes in society during these troubled times. Well, I think we are in a uh, period of uh, severe stresses period. So the the pandemic just added to an awful lot of fears and anxieties that people had. Uh, So for example, uh, automation is replacing a lot of jobs. Um, Globalization has dislodged a lot of traditional jobs and upset economies everywhere. And uh, so you have that, and then there's climate change on top of that, which is yet another thing that we all have to deal with. So there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear out there, and that translates sometimes to a lot of anger. Catch the full interview with Professor Harrison and Jeanette Roger coming up in the second half of our program. Abbotsford, B.C. Mayor Henry Braun says the city is still focused on lowering the water level on the Sumas Prairie ahead of more rain in the forecast. Braun, along with Agriculture Minister Lana Popham, met with affected farmers hearing of the extreme damage to so many properties in the area. As of today, the main dike repair is about 80% complete. We expect another five feet of height to be added to the dike prior to the weather event anticipated for Thursday. Additional crews will be moved to the erosion of the dike upstream of Atkinson Road once the main dike breach is repaired near number three road. The dike repairs near Barrowtown and Cole Road are complete. To help further prepare us, we are also fortifying the Barrowtown pump station through sandbagging and additional pumping. As everyone heard this past week, this pump station is an integral piece of infrastructure that we need to maintain operations. With support from the Canadian Armed Forces, we are also actively working to clear culverts throughout the Sumas Prairie, as well as other areas of the city. Government officials in B.C. warned that more rain is on the way for many parts of the province, which may further hinder recovery and rebuilding efforts following devastating floods. As you know, rain is once again hitting our province, with more on the way. This will impact already soaked lands and waterways. The next 9 or 10 days could be quite challenging. Environment and Climate Change Canada has warned about a series of storms. We all need to pay close attention to the experts as the forecasts for these will get more accurate the closer we get to these events. Emergency support services are working hard across the province and have registered more than 6,500 evacuees. On top of Emergency Management BC supports, existing student emergency assistance funding and Indigenous emergency assistance funding are available for students at both the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology and the University of the Fraser Valley. This money is to relieve pressure and stress on students. It is not a loan that has to be paid back and helps students pay for living expenses, travel and food. We're also working with the First Nations Health Authority and First Nations Emergency Services Society to get culturally safe support where it is needed and required. A few environmental groups are threatening to sue Premier Jason Kenney if he does not apologize for saying an inquiry found they spread misinformation about our province's oil and gas sector. The groups have given the Premier until November 30th before filing a statement of claim against him. They point to Kenney's reaction to the Allen inquiry, which looked into whether environmental groups were trying to landlock Alberta oil by spreading misinformation about its impacts. Allen's report last month said the groups were simply exercising their freedom of speech. Federal Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole addressed his party's caucus on Wednesday and went on the attack. O'Toole says Canadians are seeing a true Liberal NDP coalition right now, and that's not good news. Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Singh aren't even hiding it. For weeks, they've been openly talking about making a deal. And you know that a Liberal NDP coalition would be a disaster. 
for the Canadian economy. A Liberal NDP coalition would be a disaster for transparency and accountability after years of cover-ups under the Trudeau government. The coalition of the left will only further erode our national unity. Canada's Conservatives will not stay silent when our country's prosperity and our country's national unity are at risk. The Conservatives made things personal in the first question period since September the 20th. Calgary Tory MP Michelle Rempelgarner blamed Justin Trudeau for skyrocketing inflation, accusing him of being out of touch with the average Canadian. Earlier in question period, the Prime Minister used the phrase, even in places like Alberta, in a derogatory way that is frankly unbecoming of the Prime Minister of this country, for shame. We know what the Prime Minister thinks of workers in Western Canada, but at a time when fuel costs are rising out of control, the Prime Minister needs to stop his attack on the workers in Western Canada who provide Canada with a low-carbon, ethical and secure source of energy while merrily cheering as tankers of Saudi oil make their way down the St. Lawrence. Does the Prime Minister even know how much fuel has increased in cost since he last took questions in this place? Allow me to say that over the past many months, we have been working closely with Albertans, uh, whether it's family representatives or nonprofit organizations, who've been pushing their elected representatives to move forward on the $10 a day childcare that indeed places like Manitoba and Saskatchewan had even last Last summer, and it was with great pleasure that we saw the Conservative government of Alberta move forward and sign a historic deal on $10 a day childcare. The challenge, Mr. Speaker, is there is not one federal Conservative representative from Alberta who supports $10 a day childcare, and that is a shame for all Albertans. Government House Leader Mark Collins says he's hoping federal parties will agree to return to a hybrid parliament that would include a combination of in person and virtual attendance. Members of Parliament adopted the approach last year due to the pandemic, but need to agree to renew provisions once again. This week, um, you know, I've talked to a number of members of Parliament on a number of different sides who have health issues, who are, you know, immune compromised, who don't feel comfortable uh, in the current circumstance. Um, I know that the NDP is supportive of continuing these hybrid provisions. I'm hopeful that the other parties will reach the same conclusion. Uh, we continue to be here in full force, forcing all of those members, including those who might be in an immunocompromised position, to be in the House. I, I don't think in the middle of the pandemic that's appropriate. I still hold out hope, even as we begin debate today uh, that we can find consensus and, and get this done. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met with the president of Kosovo in Ottawa. The president thanked our Prime Minister for Canada's support of Kosovo during the dark times in 1999 when NATO bombed Serbia in support of her people. It's such a, an outstanding pleasure to be here in Canada to express the gratitude of all the people of Kosovo for what your country has done during the dark times that we had to go through, but also during the bright days. You've been with us uh, not only in 1999, when the people that I represent were at risk for extinction, unfortunately, but also after, also after freedom and independence, you were with us every step of the way while we were building our country, we were building our democracy. Obviously, the challenges that we face today are different, which is why I'm here, hopefully, to open new chapters of cooperation and to reinforce the partnership, but most importantly, the friendship between our people. Many people have been criticizing their recent throne speech by the Trudeau Liberals. You can include the Canadian Taxpayers Federation in that group. Kevin Lacey is the Alberta Director of the CTF, and he joins us now from Edmonton. Kevin, what would you have liked to have seen the Liberals put more of a focus on? Well, we would have liked to have seen the government acknowledge the struggle taxpayers are under with the rising costs of basically everything Canadians need as a result of inflation, and to hear something at least once to hear that the deficit and the debt is a big issue for them. Neither one of those things we heard in, in the throne speech. Now, Kevin, many Canadians are not only concerned about our $1 trillion debt, but also with a federal carbon tax, which is going up by how much by the year 2030? Well, by about 40 cents by 2030. And Hal, if you take a look at it, uh, Canadians are also faced under these massive other costs that are going up. Everything from groceries to clothing that their kids need. And now we're going to be faced with yet these more increases in the cost of gasoline already across Canada, about 
34 cents out of every liter is tax on gasoline. So don't let any politician or government official tell you that there's nothing they can do about the high price of gas, considering so much of it is tax. That was Kevin Lacey, Alberta Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Edmonton. Parents in Alberta began booking COVID-19 vaccinations for kids between the ages of 5 and 11. Health Minister Jason Copping says 394,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine arrived in the province. Vaccines for children in this age group are available by appointment only at 120 Alberta Health Services clinics. Government officials say the vaccine will not be available at schools and there will be no immunization requirement for kids to attend class. Now our poll question this week is, are you planning on having your child, age 5 to 11, vaccinated against COVID-19? Make sure you log on to our website and let us know your thoughts. BridgeCityNews.ca will tabulate the results and have them for you at the end of the month. Clinics in both Regina and Saskatoon are also immunizing children between the ages of 5 and 11. Premier Scott Moe says so far more than 12,000 appointments for youngsters have been booked. Saskatchewan is receiving 112,000 initial doses, which is nearly enough to give a first dose to kids and the younger age group. The Manitoba PC Party's thrown speech focused on improving health care and offering more help to people impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Lieutenant Governor Janice Philman presented the speech on behalf of Premier Heather Stephenson, who says her government will address the nursing shortage and pledges to set up a group to clear the surgery backlogs created by the pandemic. The opposition NDP wasn't buying it. Brian Pallister's repeats. And we did not see from this premier a plan to deal with the backlog of surgeries, which is going to take us years to get out of, and which is going to make Manitobans sicker and sicker. And dare I say, Manitobans' lives are at risk. Their literal lives are at risk because of the surgery backlog. We didn't see any of that in the throne speech. Prosecutors in Wisconsin have charged 39-year-old Daryl Brooks with intentional homicide in the deaths of six people who were killed when an SUV was rammed into a Christmas parade that also left 62 people injured, including many children. Mr. Brooks is facing five consecutive life sentences if he's convicted on all counts in this complaint. I wish to notify the court sadly that today we learned of another death of a child related to this case. We do expect a sixth count for first degree intentional homicide to be issued or added, excuse me, to this case. I can advise the court that I am aware, I've been made aware through investigators that there are other individuals in critical condition. I think we've remarked on the number of actual injured parties in our complaint. It exceeds 60 people. Brooks has yet to enter a plea. Brooks's bail has been set at $5 million. His attorney indicated he had no means to pay for bail. Gideon's International has been putting Bibles in hotel rooms around the world for over 100 years. The group has also been handing out Little New Testament Bibles to students in grade 5. I asked Dr. Al Anderson with Gideon's, which is now known as ShareWord Global in Canada, why they chose grade 5. You're trying to reach people at a critical juncture where they're uh, intellectually and emotionally developed enough. Um, and yet um, we know that many people become Christians as children. Uh, that they make their faith decisions in those those years. So we don't want to wait any longer uh, to give them out. Catch the full interview with Dr. Al Anderson with ShareWord Global, who will also discuss how impactful their ministry is in prisons. That Q&A is coming up later in our broadcast. Well, we woke up to a blanket of white today, but fortunately, a lot of the snow we received in Lethbridge should be disappearing. Complete weather details are coming up. It was a bit of a chilly one here in Lethbridge, snow and far below seasonal for this time of year. Jeanette Roche is back with a full look at our weather forecast. Jeanette, fortunately the mercury will be climbing and a lot of the snow should melt away. 
Yeah, it's true. If the snow was getting you in the Christmas spirit, then I have some bad news because it's probably not going to be sticking around for too much longer. If you like double digit temperatures, however, you are in luck because we have a lot of those in store for you starting with tomorrow at 11 degrees. Also, if you dislike the wind, bad news there as well. We're looking at uh, 80 kilometer per hour winds this evening and 90 K winds tomorrow. Uh, Friday, though, mix of sun and cloud, high of 10 degrees, 7 for Saturday, up to 14 degrees on Sunday, 8 for Monday and 10 degrees on Tuesday with the mainly sunny skies. So as I was saying, Mother Nature is kind of all over the place. Uh, mostly we're going to be sticking higher than these average uh, highs, though, for this time of year. Average high, 2 degrees. Uh, we weren't there today, but we will be for the rest of the week. So that is good news. Average low this time of year, minus 917 was where we were at back in 1939. And in 1996, we were minus 28. Chilly, chilly. 757 is uh, when the sun rose this morning and sunset this afternoon at 439 p.m. So a little under nine hours of daylight. As uh, we look to the west coast tomorrow, rainfall warning is in effect for Vancouver. They could be seeing uh, quite a bit of rain tomorrow, uh, over 40 millimeters, eight degrees the high. Victoria also looking at rains. Windy in both of those cities as well, nine degrees the high in Victoria. Edmonton looking at a risk of freezing rain, flurries and rain tomorrow, six degrees the high, nine degrees the high in Calgary with a mix of sun and cloud. As we look to the rest of the prairies, we are seeing a lot of wind chill factors in effect, but zero degrees the high tomorrow for Saskatoon. Mix of sun and cloud there. Minus one the high in Regina and 13, minus 13 rather, in Winnipeg. Winnipeg seeing a risk of frostbite as their wind chill factor could be up to minus 33 in the morning. So that is very chilly. Uh, rainfall in effect there for tomorrow in Toronto. Eight degrees the high, five degrees the high for Ottawa and a mix of sun and cloud tomorrow in Montreal with a high of two degrees. As we look further east into Atlantic Canada, we're seeing sunshine in Fredericton, five degrees the high there. Halifax seeing rain showers, uh, eight degrees the high, nine in Charlottetown also with showers. Showers expected tomorrow also in St. John's Newfoundland with a high of 11 degrees. So there you have it, that is your forecast. Supply chain issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic have created a divide between small and big retailers this Black Friday. Retail giants, including Canadian Tire, are offering up huge discounts, including up to 70% off of certain items. But smaller stores are struggling with ongoing supply chain headaches and rising costs with less capacity for big markdowns. Many of the local retailers can only afford around 25% off. Analysts say many retailers have backed off of their discounts this year because they do not have the inventory to support blockbuster deals. Amazon now receives over 3 billion visits to its website each and every month. That's according to data collected by Finbold. The financial analytics company says Amazon now ranks fifth globally for the website most visited. Google ranks number one with 45.4 billion visits. YouTube is second with 14.1 billion. And Facebook rounds out the top three with 11.2 billion visits. Finbold says Amazon has now established itself as an e-commerce giant attracting a significant number of shoppers globally. Canadian Pacific Railway says its proposed acquisition of Kansas City Southern could be approved in about a year. That is after the U.S. regulator established a schedule of its review. Officials say anyone wanting to participate in the proceedings as a party of record must file a notice of intent by December 13th regarding the $31 billion U.S. transaction. That would include $3.8 billion in debt. The board set the schedule after it accepted the merger application is being complete. Samsung says it is planning to build a $17 billion semiconductor factory in Texas amid a global shortage of chips used in planes, laptops and vehicles. Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Samsung made the official announcement. The chip shortage has emerged as both a business obstacle and a serious national security concern as many companies are dependent on chips produced overseas, including in Taiwan. Samsung said the groundbreaking will be in the first half of next year with plans to be fully operational by the second half of 2024. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 94 points on the day to finish at 21,548. The Dow was down 9 points to 35,804. The S&P 500 was up 10 points to 4,701. And the Nasdaq was up 70 points on the day to 15,845. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 11 cents to 78.39 U.S. per barrel. 
Natural gas was up 10 cents to 507 U.S. Gold was down 9 cents to 1788.52 U.S. an ounce. And silver was even at 2355 U.S. an ounce. Wheat is at $12.76 per bushel. Barley's at 978. Canola's at 2334. And corn is at $10.80 per bushel. Live cattle were up 250 to 137.90. Feeder cattle were up 255 to 166.93. And lean hogs were up $1.28 to $75.43. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $78.97 US. Recapping one of our top stories, after two and a half years at the helm, Lethbridge Fire Chief Mark Rathwell is retiring. His final day will be February 11th of next year. The city said it is hoping to have a new fire chief in place by mid-January. Chief Rathwell will help during the transitionary period. The gap between those who are on the right and the left appears to be widening during the pandemic. Sociology professor Trevor Harrison with the University of Lethbridge will explain why in an interview with Jeanette Rocher next. Well, since the spring of 2020, we may be feeling that our world has been flipped upside down when we consider where we are now compared to where we were prior to this global occurrence of COVID-19. We're seeing government mandates, suicides, bankruptcies, and now a great divide among Canadians and Albertans. So we want to bring in the perspective of a sociologist. Dr. Trevor Harrison is a professor of sociology at the University of Lethbridge and a research affiliate at the Prentice Institute for Global Population and Economy. Dr. Harrison joins me now via Zoom from Lethbridge. Dr. Harrison, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Dr. Harrison, you have extensive research in education and sociology. So we wanted to have you on to chat about the changes that we've seen as a result of the COVID pandemic. So over the past 20 months, of course, we've seen many societal changes. So let's take, for example, resistance to government mandates versus those who are supportive. So if we look at the timelines of development of COVID yeah. and the restrictions, was this divide of population bound to happen? What do you think? Well, I think we are in a uh, period of uh, severe stresses period. So the, the pandemic just added to an awful lot of fears and anxieties that people had. Uh, so, for example, uh, automation is replacing a lot of jobs. Um, globalization has dislodged a lot of traditional jobs and upset economies everywhere. And uh, so you have that. And then there's climate change on top of that, which is yet another thing that we all have to deal with. So there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear out there, and that translates sometimes to a lot of anger. And these are big, big collective problems that we have to deal with, climate change, pandemic, you know, economic restructuring. And it's difficult for people to get their heads around, and so it's very easy for them to kind of blame either other individuals or groups or just blame the government, say, well, or, or just not believe that there's something going on here. And, and so you get into this kind of conspiracy kind of mindset that some people have around some of these issues. Yeah, of course, it takes a pandemic like this to create all kinds of conspiracies, of course, speaking of which. So what, in your opinion, what sort of ideologies do you think leads or motivates groups that sort of uh, or follow these conspiracies or create them or certain people that follow government versus those who are resisting government mandates. We're seeing that all over the place. Yeah, I mean, besides the uh, uh, outside of just fear, anger, anxiety or, or anger towards people, the major ideological uh, drive of a lot of people who are resistant is a kind of libertarianism. Uh, you know, freedom is everything. And so, and we see that in the protests, the people holding placards or whatever, that, you know, don't take away my freedom. Um, there's a long tradition of that in the United States, of course, uh, give me freedom or give me death, as they say. Uh, but we also have that kind of libertarian populist appeal here in Alberta. And so we've kind of seen it throughout the pandemic. And there's, there's also just fatigue. I think there's a number of people who are just at this point tired and uh, anxious again. And so they don't want to believe that the problem is as bad as it is, or at least they're fooling themselves that it isn't. So, 
Yeah, and I think you're you're right that we're seeing people stand up and sort of revolt against what's happening. People, like you said, people are just tired of it, and they just want things to get back to normal. <laughs> so, in your opinion, is this something new that's happening here? We've sort of seen this in bits and pieces in the past. Even over hundreds of years, we've had people who are resistant to or don't believe there's the problem is as bad as it is, right? So, but I think it's been magnified in recent years by social media. So the social media has become a nice vehicle for carrying either just plain untruths or misinformation or conspiracy theories again. And we've seen that really proliferate during this time. And uh, so I think that that part has added a kind of a nuance to uh, conspiracies that we have not seen in the past. Conspiracies travel at the speed of sound now, whereas they used to have to travel by pony. <laughs> It's true. You bring up a very good point with social media, absolutely. Uh, so, But it's just interesting to see now how families and workplaces are interacting differently now. People are disagreeing with each other. We're seeing neighbors turning on neighbors, family members turning on family members. I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know if uh, you've studied anything uh, that's looked similar to this. Have we ever seen anything like this before? Um, there's a couple of things that make this also very different. Because of globalization, we're all much more interconnected than we would have been before. That means that the pandemic itself has become a pandemic. It is spread right across the world. The information and misinformation around it has also spread right around the world. Uh, it, in past pandemics, if it might have been located just to a village or a region, but it's now spread everywhere. There's an interesting part, I think, is also says something about modern society, and that is our education levels. Um, it's uh, an interesting thing that um, I think most people who are fairly well educated, certainly in the fields of biology and medical issues, actually understand what is going on. And so they're more prone to say, OK, I understand it. I know the reason. I know how pandemics spread. I know the nature of disease, et cetera. There are also a lot of people out there who, frankly, are extremely well educated. Uh, and Canada has some of the highest education levels in the world. But there's a lot of people who misapprehend their own capacity to understand things. <laughs> so you can be incredibly educated in one field and believe that you have huge efficacy to understand everything. And so one of the things I've noted is that people who are actually very, very smart, but smart in their own area, don't understand the rationale behind having you know, uh, protections against the pandemic because they think they understand. And so they tend to get fooled and they fool themselves about the information. Um, the analogy I use is I know what I know. I also know what I don't know. So if I'm doing electrical work, I bring in an electrician because I know that electricians know what they're doing. But there's a lot of people don't uh, they misunderstand their own capacity to understand what's going on in terms of a pandemic. Now, this might be a conspiracy in itself, but do you feel that there's an attempt by some world leaders to use the COVID experience to forge new societal attitudes? Uh, it is, you know, the, the saying is sometimes never waste a good crisis. You know, so, I mean, people will use various crises in order to maximize their own power. But I don't think in this instance that's necessarily the case. I think that this is this truly is a medical issue. This is a health issue. And, uh, you know, the, the closest comparison to this would be probably in the Second World War. You know, this is a collective action problem. So we all have to pull together in collectively to get through this particular war against the pandemic. Um, and after it's over, after, afterwards, we can probably relax again and we'll sort of go back to the old ways again. But right now, this does require a certain kind of collective action. And I think a lot of people 
simply for whatever reasons don't want to understand that that's the nature of it. It is a kind of war out there. Uh, we've lost millions of people at this point, and uh, you know we're not going to get back to normal until we actually beat beat back this pandemic. Are you able to explain the idea behind temporary shocks versus long term shocks? Like, do they have a purpose in changing uh, the way that society thinks? Yeah, one of the things that's actually happened in the last few decades is that we are, the shocks are coming actually uh, faster and faster and, and more severely. If we can just, you know, tweak our memories back a short period here, we've actually had a lot of, for example, economic shocks in the last 25 years, and they seem to be happening, whereas we had great depressions that might happen every 40 years. We had a fairly major recession in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we had another recession. Then we had the huge Great Recession in 2008-10, which we still have not actually recuperated from. So that's one shock that I think continues to reverberate through the systems. That's one of the reasons that a lot of people are angry at and fearful about the power of either governments that they blame or corporations that they blame or just banks. Then you add on top of that the, the very real climate shocks that we're getting. And we're looking out to BC right now and we see the massive flooding following on the heels of massive uh, fires, uh, heat waves around the world that are unprecedented in their severity and their longevity. Um, and then on top of that, we've got, you know, this pandemic now. So we're, we're getting a lot of shocks that are in some sense also interconnected, but in very complex ways. And I think, again, this has provided a kind of um, added to fear and anxiety. And again, the belief that someone must be doing this. And so who do we blame for it? Speaking of which, there's also a term floating around that's referred to as countless rebellions as a tool for creating new society in Canada. Can you shed, shed any light on this tool or others that are similar? Yeah, I haven't heard that particular term before, but we are in kind of a period where uh, it's very easy to mobilize people towards um, some kind of collective action. You know, so you have individual actors as well, but uh, collective actions to try to change things. And uh, so, for example, um, the uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, is primarily young people who are uh, upset with what's going on with climate change and believe that really um, th the world is is uh, not going to a good place unless we take some pretty radical, radical action. But you also get, and more scarily, I think, actually on the political right, you get uh, really the rise of neo-fascist movements, uh, you know, a Proud Boys and others. We saw this down in the United States uh, during the Trump administration. There are some extremely um, dangerous uh, hard right uh, movements and governments in Europe, in Hungary, much of the former Soviet East Bloc. Uh, these are, this is a kind of reversion to um, Nazism, fascism. And again, it follows though the same kind of pattern where things are going wrong and so groups of people are looking for a savior, uh, you know, some messianic figure, some movement that is going to save us because groups of people have lost faith in traditional institutions, governments, parties, corporations, whatever, and they say the old path isn't working. We need someone else that's going to save us. And so that's why you're seeing particularly a lot of, as I said, a lot of movements on the political right that are promising some kind of fast and swift action to get things back to normal again. That's very, very interesting. So where are we headed with all of this? What does our future look like? Well, it, it may look not very good at the moment, and uh, you know, but the only way out for human beings is really through clear and rational action. Again, working together, though, there's no way most of these problems are so huge that individuals can't in and of themselves solve them. So there is a requirement here for collective action. 
um, the uh, we have to work through some kind of governing authority. That means government. We should not, of course, be uncritical of governments. Uh, and as citizens, we should actually work to make sure the governments are, in fact, representing us. Um, but we need clear, rational, uh, objective evidence to act on to try to work through these things. Um, there's no way to fantasize our way out of these things. A pandemic is a real thing. Economic problems are real things. Uh, climate change is a real thing. <laughs> we need to think our way through uh, and first of all, acknowledge what the real problems are out there and then think of a plan of action to deal with it. Dr. Trevor Harrington, thank you so much for all of your insight today, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You may have heard of the ministry called Gideon's International. It's been distributing free Bibles to people around the world for over 100 years. But the Canadian division of this ministry has made some changes. Dr. Al Anderson is going to discuss some of those changes. He's the president of Share Word Global. Dr. Anderson, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you very much. Now, why did the name change from Gideon's International in Canada to Share Word Global? Is the ministry maybe doing things a little differently now? It's a great question. And as you can imagine, it's a question I'm asked quite frequently. Uh, why would you possibly give up a name with the kind of recognition that the Gideons has uh, for a new name? And so, uh, brief story, uh, this goes back 10 years when the Gideons in Canada broke away from the Gideons International based in Nashville. That it came because of a CRA ruling and a number of other factors. And at that point, we re-envisioned our ministry. We asked ourselves the question, how, what would we like to be going forward? So that's when we invited women to be full members. We broadened the vocational uh, opportunities so anyone could join. And we started partnering quite a bit more with the local church. Uh, those were all things that were different uh, than the Gideons International. Five years ago, we launched a new international ministry. Because we can't call ourselves Gideons outside of Canada, we called ourselves Shareward Global. And we worked extensively with local churches around the world to share the gospel and, uh, and share scripture in that context. And that ministry flourished tremendously, uh, so much so that we want to pioneer that back here in Canada as well. So is it safe to say, is it safe to say that evangelism and discipleship are still at the very core of what you're all about? That's right. The, the, the Gideons historically have always been dedicated to Scripture, recognizing that it is the Word of God and transforms people. And our longing is to see people come to a living faith in Jesus, enter the kingdom of God. Our, what we're adding is that we're enrolling members of the local church to multiply the effort. So we're helping people who might be afraid otherwise to get over those fears, to be inspired, to actually go out and make disciples of all nations. Now, do you have any evidence or proof that people are actually reading the Bibles that you're leaving behind in hotel rooms? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's principally anecdotal, but we're getting letters, emails, uh, you know, Facebook messages all the time uh, from people who have, well, oftentimes who have come to hotel rooms uh, to end their lives, who've come to hotel rooms with uh great depression and brokenness, and as a last straw, have opened up the scriptures, and many of those people have become Christians uh, right then and there, and uh, it's been a, you know, significant and radical change for their, for their lives. That is incredible. You know, by opening God's Word, just the power inside of that Word of truth and love and forgiveness, that's incredible. Do you have any other examples of life-changing experience from people opening those Bibles that they're finding? Well, um, as you know, in Canada, we also distribute scriptures to grade five students. 
And it is extraordinary as I go across the country, the number of people who will tell me they received a scripture as a grade five student, didn't really look at it, didn't care much for it, but kept it and it traveled with them over the years. And at that critical juncture in their lives where they were really struggling with uh, meaning and purpose and oftentimes their own brokenness, they, they found that, that little New Testament again, opened it and, and, and it saved their lives. You know, I remember as well when I was a child in grade five and I received one of those as well, those little, I think there was a little red New Testament uh, Bible, you know, it was very small. And I believe I still have that to this day. You're absolutely right. So let me ask you something. When it comes to handing out these little New Testaments, like I said, that I received when I was in grade five, why grade five? Why not grade four, maybe grade six? Um, you, you're trying to reach people at a critical juncture where they're uh, intellectually and emotionally developed enough. Um, and yet um, we know that many people become Christians as children. Uh, that they make their faith decisions in those those years. So we don't want to wait any longer uh, to give them out. Now let's talk a bit about evangelism. Do you think it's maybe becoming a little old-fashioned? I mean, I read recently that a Barna survey showed that 44% of many youth feel it's wrong to share your personal beliefs with someone of a different faith. But what are your thoughts? Well, we, we see that, of course. Uh, and I mean, it is the youth are, are particularly negative about evangelism, but quite honestly, we find uh, um, older people who are equally hesitant and are afraid. Um, they don't want to break relationships with their friends or in their community. They, they are really afraid of getting a hostile reaction if they share about their faith. And there's increasingly in our society, there's a sense that there is no, uh, there is no truth, and so it's presumptuous to think that you might have something that would apply to another person's lives. And Jesus said, "He is the way, the truth, and the life." Now, today's generation spends a lot of time on social media. Doctor Anderson, how is ShareWord Global using social media to really reach people for Christ? Well, it's interesting, you know, the pandemic has resulted in our ministry doing a lot of work uh, in the video, in the digital space. Um, we're, we were required to do that. It, it has provided a great discipline for us to be more active in that arena. And so we've been launching uh, digital mission trips where we're inviting members and people in churches to come alongside us, be encouraged to share their faith, and then use their social media networks uh, to proclaim Jesus. And again, there have just been tremendous uh, feedback from that, numerous stories of people who've reached out to their friends and actually found here in this pandemic that people are looking for a, a truth uh, they're looking for solutions. They're asking the deeper questions. And, and when people initiated about the faith, they got a terrific reception. Now, we talked a bit about the, the Bibles that are found in hotel rooms, also, of course, giving out to the students. What about hospitals and prisons here in Canada? Do they still accept Bibles to be distributed, or is there maybe some resistance? Um, well, you know, growing, culturally, we see a growing resistance. Um, that's, that's even in the hotel rooms, uh, in, in the schools. Uh, many of the hotels will say, no, they're not interested. Um, and, and that's true in, in hospitals as well. Although, again, during the pandemic, there was a tremendous opportunity. We have a, we have a scripture magazine called a Hope Magazine that has psalms that are uh, hopeful, and the Gospel of John. And we found uh, that those were well received in hospitals, especially when, as patients were not able to see uh, their family or their friends, and uh, nurses and doctors were uh, be just basically becoming exhausted because of the work. 
And so anything that offered hope in that context was well received. Do you have any stories of inmates who have been touched by reading God's word? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, as you can only imagine, that's a time that that would be prone to self-reflection and being open to new things. And so, yes, there's um, actually there's a couple of very interesting videos uh, uh, that are testimonies from prisoners in those those exact circumstances. Now, ShareWord Global is making every effort to work together with local churches. What does that really look like for you? Well, it's interesting. Um, oftentimes, churches, I, I mean, I'm sympathetic for pastors. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of demand. There's a congregation to care for. And when outside agencies approach them, uh, sadly, it's often uh, they're looking for resources from the church. And so we've adopted a basic posture that, that we want to serve the church. So we um, none of the things that we do cost anything uh, for the pastors. We offer an opportunity uh, for their congregation to be inspired to share the Share, share the gospel and to share scripture, that, that we will help them to uh, be courageous in that. And pastors are often quite shocked that we are coming with a gift for the church um, as opposed to the other way around. You know, Doctor, I think some viewers may also think of Gideon's or now ShareWord Global as a group of older people handing out Bibles. But are you getting some interest from younger people as well, maybe to get involved with evangelism? Yeah, especially if we go about doing things. I mean, our the Gideons for 110 years now, ShareWord Global, has always been characterized as people who uh, don't spend a lot of time talking, but instead uh, go out and do something. And and we're finding that uh, the the Younger generations, millennials and Gen Z, love to go out and do something. And so we will spend a little bit of time inspiring, give, give them a few tools, but right away we apply it. We go out and do something. And we're finding that that's very attractive for the young people. I'm just curious, how many Bibles, let's say last year at 2020, uh, Gideon's or Sherwood Global actually handed out? Um, so it would have been almost 2 million. That's both domestically and internationally. Uh, domestically, it would have been about three quarters of a million. Where does the funding actually come from to produce a lot of these Bibles? That's a lot of Bibles to head out nationally and internationally. Yeah, there, there are quite a number of donors here in Canada, churches, foundations, uh, major businesses that are interested in making sure that God's word is distributed to people, that people do hear the gospel. And um, they've been very faithful and dedicated to us. And, uh, you know, we're grateful for their contribution to this mission. Absolutely. So what would you say to anyone who has interest in either financially supporting what ShareWord Global is doing, or maybe even volunteering with you to help get the good news out there? I would say, please, let us tell you what God is up to these days. It is really amazing. Uh, you, um, you mentioned prisons, for instance, here in Canada. Uh, we've just been invited uh, by the government of Kenya to train uh, all of their chaplains and Christian inmates in their entire prison system to share the gospel and distribute scripture throughout all the prisons in the country. Um, there are opportunities here in Canada and around the world that are astounding uh, for us to impact uh, things for the gospel. And we're uh, thrilled to do that. And we would love to have people join us in that. Have you had much resistance from some of the other countries around the world where Christians are being persecuted? I'm thinking specifically of China, you know, North Korea, Pakistan, and so forth. 
Have you tried to get Bibles into those countries as well? Yes. Um, uh, Pakistan and China are two of the countries that we are active in. Um, and it is challenging. I mean, there, there are restrictions. Oftentimes, it requires a very uh, delicate negotiation. Um, but at least up to this point, we've found that we can continue uh, to distribute scripture. We're, we've even found there are some shocking and surprising opportunities. Uh, the, the governments of Nicaragua and Cuba have invited us to come in and work with their churches and distribute scripture throughout the entire country. It's amazing to see God working all around the world. Dr. Al Anderson is the president of ShareWord Global. Thanks so much for your time today and joining us from Guelph, Ontario. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching.